Chapter 25. 1990. Rayo sat at the hill station bar, remembering the night he and Miriam had gone. The for drinks before going to the Chinese restaurant next door. He remembered. Bayard sharing hot spring rolls, and each of them claiming to be better than their other with their chopsticks when neither of them could manage to bring food to their mouths without it falling off the sticks first. They had laughed a lot that night, like new lovers, and then went home to make love so passionately that it had given him hope. But that was then. Now Kemi and Miriam had left him for a life in England. Teo sighed, pushing aside the saucer of ground nuts and shaking his head to the offer of another beer. Music pulsated from speakers. Half hidden by fat bottles of Bacardi and Scotch, and the barman sang along to a tune that Teo recognized. Who's this artist? Teo asked. Michael Jackson, sir, the barman answered. Teo nodded. Yes, it was Kemi's music, although now that he was a frequent visitor to bars perhaps it was more accurate to say that pop songs had also become his music. He presumed Kemi still listened to Mr. Jackson, but that too might have changed. Two businessmen sat next to him, sipping their lagers and debating, in hushed tones, the likely pros and cons of starting an import-export business in the 1990s. Teo guessed they were speaking quietly so that no one could swipe their ideas, but at times their excitement seemed to get the better of them, and he caught snatches of conversation. One believed in importing electric generators on the basis of predicted increased power shortages, which begged the question. How could Nigeria's Electrical Power Authority possibly get any worse? Already, Napa was off more than on, and hence the joke, never expect power always. By 1994, I'm telling you, the man exclaimed excitedly, waving an index finger in front of his friend's nose, I'm tickling you that so many pkapluk, in fact. I can even say 90% of Nigerians will be begging for generators. The friend seemed unconvinced, arguing instead for the importation of me. Seeds Benz spare parts and the export of Nigerian curios and thorn carvings. Teo smiled sadly to himself at what their conversation suggested about a can. Try in which continuing chaos and greed were taken for granted. Had his father still been alive, he would have been shocked. Father had always thought that the best investments were in land, so much so that Teo remembered it feeta. In their last conversation, they had been touring the family farm, walking slowly because of father's weakened state, past the rows of maize, yams and sweet potatoes. Teo missed his father, now there was no one older and wiser to 100k to for advice. But perhaps it was better that father had not lived to see his country fall apart while the rest of the world emerged from the tyranny and fear of the Cold War. Of course there were always a few things Nigerians could feel proud of. Soyinka had won the Nobel Prize, Okri had claimed the Booker, and father would certainly have enjoyed all the sporting successes. Who could forget that? Splendid African Cup final of 1980 when the Green Eagles screamed Algeria 3-0? But such glories could not compensate for all that was wrong with the nation. And it wasn't just Nigeria but the whole continent that seemed to be suffering. Teo looked wearily beyond the bar to the open doors leading to the pool. There. Sky had darkened to a backdrop for thunder and menacing claps of lightning. Outside, families were hurriedly gathering their towels and belongings before. The first raindrops fell. Waiters dashed about, collecting abandoned deck chairs. Before sprinting back through the bar to the main foyer. Some of the guests would be staying at the hotel, but many, a mix of Africans and Europeans, 
would be locals visiting for the afternoon, the way Teo used to come with Miriam and Kemi. He watched people running from the rain and spotted a teenage girl whose confident stride reminded him of Kemi. Teo smiled at her. But she didn't see, or else had been taught to be wary of strangers. All day long. It had been like this, one event after another, causing him to seriously doubt the wisdom of staying on while his family had left for England. It began in there. Morning with the broken water pump, which the mechanics insisted could not be fixed without spare parts from China. The next headache came when their houseboy announced that he would be returning home to Kafenjin for the burial of a Klatuk. Then, as if this WCRC not enough, HC had just wasted precious time with Mr. Peters. It all started when Simon wrote to Teo at the beginning of the year. They had not been in touch since their Oxford days, but Simon had kept abreast of Teo's news through the Balliol record and, when he was appointed chairman of a prestigious London foundation, he immediately contacted Teo, who was thrilled to receive the letter with its mention of possible funding for his university. Foundations generally marched to the tune of the World Bank and IMF, arguing that what Africa needed was vocational and not academic education. So Simon's foundation offered fresh hope. Contacts were eagerly established. And arrangements made for Mr. Peters, Simon's Africa director, to visit Nigeria. In preparation for the meeting, Teo had put together all the relevant papers and statistics. He had even cancelled plans to travel to New York, where he was to have received an award for his new book. And this was all for the sake of a meeting which turned out to be a waste of time. Why had the man even both erred to come over when his mind was already made up about any donations there? Foundation would make. He offered second hand books, none of which were requested by the university, as well as old software programs that were use less without the computers the university desperately needed. Teo leaned against the bar, reflecting on the fact that he had stayed in Nige. Ria in order to help the university and his students, yet in reality he had provided little help. Last month he had received a suitcase full of cash, an anonymous bribe from the authorities to stop him complaining about government policies. H.C. had refused it, but now the threats were less veiled. Glanced at his watch, waiting for his students to arrive and wondering. He would tell them. He would have to admit that he had been misled into. That the foundation would support their graduate study. Teo pushed. Believing little further from the bar for a better look outside and saw that there. Had stopped. Workers were busy wiping the plastic deck chairs dry and. His seat a. Them again in green slip covers. With no guests outside, the men sang. Rain. Loudly, clicking their fingers and rolling their shoulders to Bob. Worry, about a ting, cause every little ting, gonna be all right. Teo swiveled on his stool to look back inside. Behind the bar was a recessed. Lounge with leather seats and booths, a more comfortable area to drink and. Chat? Teo noticed too. Other than them. The girls wore mini skirts and strapless tops, so were probably. Why else would they be with overweight, middle aged men? It was. Prostitutes. Simply a question of economics and the amount of cash that could be extracted. His gaze lingered and then returned to the woman he had noticed first who sat on her own, drinking a Fanta. She was white and wore a tie-dye dress and sandals that marked her as either someone who lived in Joe's and dress in the way of the locals, or perhaps a tourist. She was reading when one of their waiters approached her and stood before her with his tray held loosely in one hand behind his back. In the background Bob Marley sang, 
I don't wanna wait. In vain for your love. Teo smiled at the irony, or perhaps the setup as the woman looked up. She tucked her hair behind her ear, and Teo saw that she was younger than he had initially thought. Young and beautiful, the way he remembered Vanessa. The waiter hovered, but when the woman returned to her book, he took his cue and left. She wore a wedding band, which made Teo wonder whether her husband was Nigerian or European. There were not many Anglo Nigerian couples around these days, most had divorced or left the country. Again, Teo thought of Vanessa. He drummed his fingers on the cardboard beer mat and nodded to the new beat. It was Fela's famous lady, in praise of the African woman's ability to follow her man, dance and show respect, rather than don Ning modern independent ways. The beat was catchy and the lyrics provocative. Vintage Fela. Teo had never taken the words of the song seriously but, today, because he was thinking about women, he gave it more thought. His own African woman had not always followed him and he had never demanded that Miriam do so. Or had he? Certainly when they first met, she had been more eager to please him than in later years and perhaps subconsciously. He had thought that Miriam would strike a perfect balance between the modern and the traditional in a way that had never been guaranteed with Vanessa. But, in the end, she had done her own thing anyway. He sighed wearily, wishing he could see Vanessa again, just for old time's sake. If she came to Jos he would show her all the scenic spots, the reservoir, the marketplaces, the rocky out underscore crops and, of course, Joe's museum. He imagined that she would enjoy explaining the significance of the art to him and he would marvel at her knowledge. They would eat at the bite of Benin, hands touching beneath the tablecloth, and they might even stay here in Hill Station's guest rooms, which always looked charming from the outside, small cottages with wooden beams. Teo pictured the rooms with large beds, white linen and soft feather pillows. Perhaps the rooms also had plush carpeting, air conditioning and maybe even a fireplace for the cooler Harmattan months so that when she came, Teo shook his head as a reprimand to his flight of fantasy, he looked again at the woman and considered going to say hello, but then someone else ap appeared. The man looked older than her, perhaps in his fifties or sixties. He greet Ed the bartenders in Horson and, from the enthusiastic replies, Teo guessed there. Man to be a regular and probably wealthy. No doubt a high-ranking military officer in civilian clothes. They were the rich ones these days. He wore white shorts, a blue polo neck shirt and loafers of a style and quality that looked imported. The couple embraced, she shyly, he less so. He grasped her buttocks and kissed her on the lips. The businessman had stopped talking and the barman was no longer humming as the couple came to the bar and ordered two beers. Teo was thinking of how things used to be with Miriam when he felt a tap on his shoulder and jumped. Professor Ajay. Hoa, he replied, hoping she had not seen him observing the other couple. He bought her a drink, apologizing for Mr. Peter's absence. What happened? Hoa touched his hand lightly startling Teo with her suggestion of intimacy. It was a young hand, smooth and cool to the touch. Are you okay? she asked softly. I'm fine. He placed his other hand on top of hers to pat it gently as best as he could, in a fatherly, professorial way.